you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I always feel a bit embarrassed when people introduce you. Maybe it's the kind of nature of the way we like to see ourselves in the world. But um, if you are looking forward to a PowerPoint presentation, you're going to be disappointed. Um, I used to do lots of PowerPoint presentations, but I've come to realise that they, they are neoliberal I instruments in themselves and, and actually antithetical to kind of critical pedagogy, which is something that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, in a sense, what they do is they take dialogue away from us all and stick it onto a screen. So no PowerPoint today. So uh, I have written a paper, actually. Again, I was saying I'm reclaiming the Humboldtian tradition. Yeah, kind of. Uh, so if you, if you want to uh, have a copy of this, I can, I can share it with you. Um, and, so, and it's a bit kind of like serendipity that I was asked to do this talk, because actually I'm, 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 I've been writing a paper uh, trying to, uh, which, which is kind of satirically called when uh, Marty I met Paolo, yeah? Social work, human care building, critical pedagogy. Although today's talk is not going to be much about social work because I wanted to try and uh, kind of really see the relevance to a wide range of people who are working in, in, with human beings, really, in, in kind of what might call social development kind of areas. So it's not going to be much on social work today. It's going to be quite a philosophical uh, discussion as well, so if anybody's interested in philosophical discussions, then this is your day. Okay? Uh, but do stop me, but I'm going to just go through what I've written. Yeah, so one of the most fundamental and arguably unresolved questions within political philosophy is the relationship between social structure and human agency. And in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Karl Marx famously stated, quotes, men make their history but they do not make it as they pleased. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given the transmit and transmitted from the past. The, tr the tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Though Marx was offering a commentary of how revolutionary movements seeking to break free from the past end up borrowing the same language and ideas of the past, and even perhaps rep repeating the same mistakes of the past. There is a deeper observation about the nature of the relationship between human beings and society in this um, uh, quote. This relates to the issue of human agency or the capacity for individuals to act autonomously and to make their own free choices uh, based on their free will. And in seeking to understand the process that may lead to a, lead to a person relinquishing free will, the existential Marxist philosopher John Paul Sartre coined, coined the phrase Mavuze uh, foi or bad faith. In fact, uh, in the face of social forces, then, that may require us to adopt certain social roles, Sartre suggests that we often choose self deception into thinking that we do not have the freedom to make choices. So, this presentation is really about the question of human freedom, of how we can enable people to exercise real choice, or if you like, self determination and the role that education can play in enabling this. Accordingly, it's clear that professions such as social work and a whole range of other professions, working with people in real concrete situations in, in, in social development and social welfare and community development, where we are increasingly required to enable the users to express choice and practice in antipressive ways, um, you know, that can benefit immensely from a close examination of these ideas. Uh, the most prevalent word in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was proclaimed by, uh, by the UN General Assembly in Paris on the 10th of December 1948 is... What? Anybody? Free. This is not surprising since arguably the holy grail of human rights is the promotion of freedom. Freedom can be promoted in many ways, but as Article 26 recognises, this is intimately linked to education and human development. Uh, I don't need to remind you of it, education, quotes, shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. So few people would dis argue, disagree with the basic premise that education is a human right, though it begs the question what is meant by education, or more specifically, what kinds of pedagogical strategies will enable people to achieve their full development. Now, whilst for centuries formal education was denied to most people, from the early 20th century, as the educational institutions expanded, debates around these questions assumed much more focus 
with the issue of pedagogical practice taking centre stage. And amongst the early thinkers to address the question of both the function of education and its relationship to human development was the American pragmatist philosopher and educational reformer John Dewey, who famously proclaimed in his book Democracy and Education that education is not a preparation for life, education is life itself. Uh, in closely aligning education to personal development, Dewey was drawing attention to model and political dimensions of the educational enterprise and its connection to a radically democratic transformation of the person and society itself. And in this presentation, I'd like to explore the relationship between education, freedom, development, and the possibilities of radical transformation. That's the kind of, yeah, so that was the kind of introduction. So what are the connections then? So both through my work on anti-racist and anti pressive social work and in more recent times, my engagement with inequity in higher education, all of these themes have resonated and I've come to realise the importance of understanding both the importance of agency and the material and psychosocial factors that may deny it, inhibit and liberate individuals to exercise genuine freedom. Uh, I will do this by comparing and contrasting the work of Matthias Sen the Nobel Prize winning development econ economist and Paolo Freire, who essentially is a teacher and educationalist, renowned for improving literacy amongst peasants in Brazil. Now coming from different disciplines and ground realities, on the surface one might think that they have little in common. But as I will argue in the presentation, in reality taken together their work offers a fascinating insight into yin and yang of human development. Sen regarding development economics and Freire regarding development education. And so though their methods are, were quite different, both share a deep commitment to human freedom and its importance to overcoming poverty, deprivation and oppression, and both see human liberation as a means to development. So the antecedents of the human capabilities approach, though the capabilities approach has become popularised in, in the latter part of the 20th century, in particular through the work of Amartya Sen, its antecedents can be found in the mid-20th century against the backdrop of two key historical developments. The context of the emergence of the welfare states within developed industrialised countries in the global north, essentially Europe and North America, and the emergence of poverty-stricken post-colonial societies across the global south and east. South America, Africa, Middle East and Asia. For the form of the development model was essentially focused at the national level. For example, within the UK we saw attempts to establish universal entitlements to health, housing and education and welfare, which came out of the Seminole Beveridge Report. This was uh, chaired by the economist Will William Beveridge, who identified the five giant evils in society of squalor, ignorance, want, idleness and disease and went on to propose widespread reform to a system of welfare to address these. Of course, it would be naive to think that these concerns and developments were parochial in nature. Many of the reformist politicians that were presiding over the creation of the welfare state in the UK were also looking further afield. Uh, fueled by a combination of model and political imperatives, the new leaders of the formal col colonial powers were also having to contend with the spectacle of underdevelopment in the former colonies of poverty and famine, disease and conflict, of political and economic turmoil. And that kind of sounds familiar today as well, isn't it? This is not a historical kind of problem. A good example of this growing internationalisation of human development can be found in the War on Want movement, which began with a, a, a letter from Victor Golanze, a left-wing publisher, to The Guardian, then the Manchester Guardian, on the 12th of February 1951. Like today in Syria and other places where we're witnessing wars, in Korea and other parts of Southeast Asia, untold middle misery, Glanzi demanded that, and quote, that a great international fund should be established as an urgent matter of life and death for improving the conditions of those fellow human beings who, to the number of hundreds of millions, are starving, destitute, and despair. End of quote. The letter provoked a huge response, resulting in the Labour government at the time, Harold Wilson, drawing up a report entitled War on Want, a Plan for World Development. Yeah? Which, which did, as I said, result in the War on Want movement as well. Uh, we can also see the birth of the World Health Organization, uh, which was established in 1948, as another example of this uh, emerging international, transnational kind of uh, structures, really, trying to address questions of development and well-being. 
Uh, and more recently, we've got the uh, 17 Sustainable Developmental Goals adopted by uh, world leaders in 2015, uh, where there's a recognition on obtaining a quality education is the foundation to improving people's lives and sustainable development. So this kind of relationship between development and education resonates over and over again. Yeah? So to understand Sen's work, it's important to reflect aspects of his life that clearly impacted his thinking. In this regard, one has to consider the deep influence that the, uh, the Bengali Nobel Prize winner Rabindranath Tagore had on shaping his thought. Their closeness is perhaps more pa most powerfully demonstrated by the fact that Tagore actually gave him his name. Uh, you know, Amartya Sen was named by Tagore. Glasman and Patton suggest that, like John Dewey and Paulo Freire, and their expansive view of education and democratic life, Amartya Sen, having spent much of his early life at Rabindranath Tagore's school in Santikinitian, where the philosophy of education closely resembled that of John Dewey. Sen was clearly influenced by both Tagore's localised and experience-based curriculum ideas and Gandhi's idea of basic education, envisaging education as being part of the battle against oppressive systems. They're going to suggest that there is a close harmony between Sen's capabilities approach, especially as it might evolve at the local community level and the participatory aspects of Freire's ideas on education. And in his Nobel Prize winning speech, Amartya Sen talked about the terrible experience of communal violence that he witnessed as a child in Bengal during the 1940s and how it shaped his thinking. And I'm going to quote from his speech. He said, the experience was devastating for me and suddenly made me aware of the dangers of narrowly defined identities and also the divisiveness that can lie buried in communal politics. He also alerted me to the remarkable fact that economic unfreedom in the form of extreme poverty can make a person a helpless prey in the violation of other kinds of freedom. So indeed against the backdrop of the so-called war on terror and the rise of all kinds of fundamentalisms in his book Identity and Violence, The Illusion of Destiny, which he published in 2007, he would return to the themes, these very same themes, uh, and the challenge of sectarianism, religious fundamentalism and violence in the kind of present moment. The term human capabilities closely relate to much wider scholarship within human and international development and the basic needs approach. An important underpinning aspect of these approaches is the growing influence of human rights and social justice that emerged within the mid part of the 20th century in what we characterise the post-colonial era. So most crucially, the objective ec economic development was seen not merely as an instrument for economic progress, in other words, making money, but about enhancing human well-being. Uh, human beings become the objective economic activity. This concept of a broader human development framework was first laid out by Amartya Sen, but later expanded on by and developed by Martha Nussbaum uh, and Anara O'Neill, who particularly focused on uh, gender and human development. So in essence, in, in essence, the development approach seeks to address two questions, providing people with choices to enable them to lead fulfilling lives, and developing economic models and strategies to maximise the possibility of economic growth and justice. There are various frameworks for measuring human development, but the one developed by the UN entitled Human Development Index, which combines measures of life expectancy, literacy, educational attainment and GDP per capita for countries. And so whilst there is close correlation with the human development approach and the capabilities approach, one key criticism of the human development economic model was that simply improving the economic wealth of a country was no guarantor of human development. Okay. <coughs> so this conundrum is perhaps most powerfully seen in the Middle East where despite the huge wealth derived from natural resources, the vast proportion of the populations are still in absolute poverty. And so coupled with the apparent limitations of existing structural approaches, and the emergence of new social movements in the 1980s onwards, we see a shift towards what might be termed a bottom-up or people-centred approach. It is in this context that we see a shift from the notion of human development to human capabilities. And this difference could be captured, captured in the idea that to give somebody some fish will feed the family for a day, to teach somebody to fish will feed the family for life as a model of empowerment. Though there still remains the question how do you procure the equipment to catch the fish? 
How do you get access to the waters in order to be able to fish? Uh, so whilst this promises some empowerment, it, it also kind of uh, ignores other factors that might stop you from fishing for the rest of your life. S it's, not easy, it's not easy to pinpoint Sen's political position as he appears to be influenced by a wide range of prominent Enlightenment philosophers, most notably Adam Smith and his analysis on the necessities of living conditions, Karl Marx's concern with human freedom and emancipation. Uh, and later Sen recognised that the most powerful conceptual connections which initially failed to appreciate it relate to Aristotle's theory of political distribution and his analysis of eudaimonian human flourishing as well. So whilst the roots of the capitalist approach can be traced back to Aristotle, classical political economy of, uh, and Marx, it's possible to identify more recent links. For example, Sen often notes that Rawls's, uh, John Rawls's theory of justice and his emphasis on self-respect and access to primary goods had deeply influenced his thinking. Sen takes uh, the trouble to compare and contrast the capabilities approach with close rivals which concentrate on entitlements, uh, the priority of liberty, human rights and human capital. But Clark suggests in doing so he generally shows that each approach has something to offer, but only Sen's human capabilities approach can address all of those concerns. So it's in a sense it's an attempt at a much more holistic approach to addressing these questions of human development and human rights. It is in Commodities and Capabilities, which he published in 1984, where we see the early development of his thought. So as I said, building on, uh, on the work of Adam Smith, John Rawls, Karl Marx, Kant, Aristotle and others, he poses a series of linked questions concerning the basis of welfare economics, specifically focusing on the assessment of personal well-being. In other words, the capability to function such as what a person can do or can be. Uh, on a person's capability to function or what, what they can do or can be. And in the book he poses what is perhaps the most complex question facing people concerned with human welfare. That is, if human well-being is the ultimate goal, how can we precisely, how can we know precisely if somebody is well, if somebody is happy, if somebody is fulfilled? And indeed, is somebody is free or having a good life? You know, what is the measure for that? And that's quite a difficult one to do. In his second book, Inequality Reexamined in 92, he introduced uh, uh, and links the questions of inequality or equ equality to his conception of functioning and capability. At the heart of his argument is the pr proposition that equality should be measured as a component of capability. So you can only be equal if you are capable of performing certain things. Yeah? The difficulty is that the idea of equality is confronted by two different kinds of diversities. Basic heterogeneity of human beings, you know, we're all different, different cultural contexts, and the multiplicity of variables in terms of which equality can be judged. Yeah? Put another way, it is the relationship between facts and values, or if you like, objective and subjective dimensions of human life. Yeah? Uh, in the book Quality of Life, which he co-authored with Martha Nussbaum, a number of authors tackled directly the question of how to define and measure quality of life and how policymakers can develop policies in various fields, from mental health, medical ethics to social welfare, and questions of gender and justice. And in 1998, Senator received the Nobel Prize for his work on economics of poverty, in which he was able to offer new ways to predict and fight famine, as well as ways of measuring poverty so that more effective social programmes could be designed. Uh, and it was in his book, Development and Freedom, uh, a year afterwards, that Sen tackled the question of agency versus structure head-on. And he poses one simple question. He says, what is the relationship between our collective economic wealth and our individual ability to live as we would like? That was the basic question that he poses. And he explains how in a world of unprecedented increase in Overall opulence, middle, millions of people living in the developing world are still not free. Even if technically slavery no longer exists, he questions how poor people are still denied elementary freedoms and remain imprisoned in one way or another by economic poverty, social deprivation, political tyranny or cultural authoritarianism. In doing so, he suggests that the main goal of development must be to spread freedom and what he terms a thousand charms to the people. <coughs> For Sen, then, 
Freedom must at once be the ultimate goal of social and economic arrangements and the most efficient means of realising general welfare. So let me just repeat that because this is a kind of central to his. For Sen, freedom must at once be the ultimate goal of social and economic arrangements and the most efficient means of realising general welfare. This idea very much harks back to Adam Smith in his treatise on the wealth of nations when he suggested that and uh, he often harshly criticised those who act purely out of self-greed and warns that, quote, all for ourselves and nothing for other people seems in every age of the world to have been the vile maxim of the masters of mankind. Indeed, whilst Adam Smith's solutions and overall views on the best mechanism for creating wealth are diametrically opposed to the political economy of Karl Marx, the whole question of distributive justice was of concern to him. Smith was concerned with the way that capitalists, he called merchants, left to own their own devices without any regulation would tend to work against the interest of the collective. As Smith notes in The Wealth of Nations, quote, people of the same trade seldom meet together or even merry for merriment or diver uh, diversion, but the conversation ends in the conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So drawing from the previous discussion then, uh, the capability approach can thus be summarised as a model that ensures that the primary aim of social policy is to expand human functionings. Uh, in inequality re-examined, Sen writes, a person's capability to achieve functionings. So this is important to understand the difference between capability and functionings. You know, we can have capabilities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can function. You know, a good example would be, most of us have the means to live a healthy lifestyle, yeah? Uh, most of us have the knowledge about what healthy eating or healthy living is. But how many of us actually live healthy lifestyles? So we have the capability, but we're not functioning, yeah? And in, in a sense, that's part of the challenge, is how we can bridge that gap. Um, and if it's difficult for us, who have the means, how much more difficult it is for people who don't even have the means? Yeah? So a person's capability to achieve functionings, as Sen suggests, uh, he or she has reason to value, provides a general approach to eva evaluation of social arrangements. This yields a particular way of viewing the assessment of equality and inequality. So one can see in Sen's formulation, the capability approach is essentially evaluative, in that it seeks to offer a mode to evaluate social policy against certain yardsticks that can enhance human freedom. And in that sense, there's a universalist dimension to Sen's work. Questions of choice, happiness, poverty and inequity, all of which are essential tests of progress for a given society. It is evaluative, not predictive, so it should not be used in some tick box way, which we tend to kind of, in a lot of social policy, that's what we tend to do. It's also holistic in that it seeks to integrate overarching policy frameworks with individual, community and family contexts. Here the emphasis on freedom relates not simply to abstract ideas of what it might be to feel to be free, yeah? to consume, to travel, etc. But by focusing on building on things that people value, the capability approach is explained through a key number of concepts which one needs to understand to fully comprehend that. The key ones are, as I say, functionings which I've already mentioned. Uh, when we talk about something being dysfunctional, we refer to something that is not working properly or in terms of human beings as pathologies, abnormalities or deficiencies of a bodily system or social group. Accordingly, functions are understood as activities and states that constitute well-being, such as being safe, having your mind stimulated, etc. They are the various things a person may value and have reason to value, uh, and doing activities and also state. So it, functionings are both about our, as it were, subjective emotional dimensions, but also the kind of practicalities of life as well. Yeah, it's trying to combine the two. Um, they are related to goods and income, but that's not enough. Take, for example, a person who is unable to walk. Simply providing them with money is not by itself going to enable them to exercise mobility. So related goods and income, but for saying that is not enough in that they refer to what people are actually able to do or be as a result of policy and practice interventions. Functionings can vary from simple, clear-cut things like having a nourishing diet or being able to read to quite complex things. 
That is because one of the key aspects of functioning is freedom, and therefore this might be exercised in various ways reflecting human and personal differences. Not everybody needs Facebook to function, but that doesn't mean that Facebook isn't an important aspect for functioning for some people. Sen asserts that freedom or agency is the real opportunity that we have to accomplish what we value, and this is only possible when two sets of freedoms are available, namely what he called process freedom and opportunity freedom. Now, process freedom is the ability to act on behalf of what matters. So that's the kind of like an agency. You know, for example, why and where I might want to travel or not. Opportunity freedom is the real or concrete opportunity to achieve valued functionings. You know, the possibilities of travel, yeah? Uh, so, opportunity and process. So, just to give an example of that, uh, and Sen uses this in his book, he says, he takes, for example, like a resource. So, a bicycle might be a resource. It's a resource that will give us the capability to ride around, functioning, yeah? A capability is the ability to ride, because not everybody can ride a bike. Uh, but then the functioning would be the riding around, because even if you can ride a bike, even if you've got a bike, it, you might be terrified about going on the roads because you might get killed or, yeah? So, 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 so the, the cap functioning is the actual uh, enacting of the capability. Uh, and the benefit is, you could think about in health, flourishing, all these kind of things, yeah? Another one might be food. Say food is a resource. Yeah? A capability is the ability to be nourished and functioning is actually being nourished, yeah? And the benefit might be good health and happiness. So these are kind of form the ways in which you see these relate. They're quite subtle, but they're important relationships. And I think a lot of what I find in social work is a lot of the work that social workers are doing is working between uh, nurturing capabilities but enabling functionings to take place. Yeah, uh, and uh, and that that a lot of the direct work can be involved there, and the kind of pedagogical work. Yeah. Um, there are problems with Sen's approach, um, but I. I kind of don't want to get into that uh, now because I haven't got time. I wanted to just, uh, if I can, uh, shift us on to Ferrari now, yeah? Um, Paolo Ferrari, it was noted earlier that uh, though coming from different disciplines, the key bridge between Sen and Ferrari is the relationship between development and freedom. Sen is at pains to assert the importance of what he terms authentic self-direction, yeah? So Sen talks about that freedom can only be exercised if it's authentic self-direction. I cannot tell you what freedom is. Yeah, you have to realise it for yourself. Um, and um, if you like the exercise of agency, in a kind of nutshell. For this to happen, it is important to develop critical agency, or the freedom and power to question and reassess the prevailing norms and values. And this is what Dresde and Sen talk about. Though Sen has little to say about the nature of pedagogy that may enable this self-actualization, this unleashing of agency, it is this precise question that forms the kernel of Paulo Freire's work, and therein lies the link. However, before outlining uh, uh, some of these, in order to situate Freire, it's worth briefly reviewing some of the early influences that shaped his worldview. Perhaps one of the most complete expositions of the genesis of Freire's work is the book written by Jones Irwin, Paulo Freire's Philosophy of Education, in 2012, who suggests that from the very beginning of his work, Freire develops organically from existential and political situations, often of acute terror and vulnerability. What was, lived, what was this lived experience that so much shaped his thinking, that gave birth to some of the most original enduring insights into the nature of what it was to be human, through to the idea of freedom, love, criticality, and consciousness. Yes, growing up in Brazil, described by uh, Torres as a land of contrast and a pedagogy of contradiction, like Sen Freire had to contend with the natural beauty of the land and its people, with the ugly, brutal realities of colonial exploitation, dispossession, and murder. Though he was from a relatively affluent family, Growing up in Recife in the northeastern part of Brazil, which was one of the poorest regions, Freire was not immune, in, immune from the experience of poverty. Indeed, due to the, f the family tragedy, Freire was 
for his education was seriously affected and he was some four years behind in his schooling uh, with his fellow class, uh, class fellows. Uh, so coupled with his critique of traditional Christianity in a strong Catholic culture and later his imprisonment by the regime following a military coup, this firmly situated him as an outsider, although in some senses he was an economic insider, but he, he, he was able to, as it were, as what Henri Giroux says, he was able to cross borders. Yeah, he was able to step outside. However, the upside of this experience was that he was able... So it was a negative experience he was able to connect with and understand the lives of the oppressed and how traditional forms of education or pedagogical practice were instrumental in transmitting and perpetuating opp oppression. Though he was intimately aware of the material dimensions of life, he also felt that systems of oppression were in intimately dependent on certain pedagogical practices that were in effect dehumanising. Yeah? So, you know, in his famous book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he doesn't really mention Karl Marx or dialectical materialism, and some people are criticising him for that. But he, you know, he does in his, in his interviews talk about you know, absolute, you know, the kind of dialectics of the kind of personal liberation and structural components. In his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, Mar uh, Marx famously proclaimed the philosophers only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Now, though Freire is often referred to as an educational philosopher, given that much of his thinking was informed by his own engagement with educational projects, especially those that were developing literacy with the most excluded in, in Brazilian society. His work is best characterised as what Antonio Gramsci termed a philosophy of praxis, which is aimed towards humanising the world by humanising ourselves. In contrast to the Hegelian dialectics, which relies, con uh, contradict relies on contradictory processes between opposing ideas, or Marx and Engels' dialectical materialism, where the thought and material reality are essentially split into separate realms, practice offers, as Gramsci notes, in, uh, the po possibility to fuse politics and philosophy, or thinking and acting. Strongly influenced by Gramsci's philosophy of practice, Freire states that, quote, freedom is not an ideal located outside of man, nor is it an idea which becomes myth. It is an indispensable condition for the quest for human completion. In order to become, become truly free, one must recognise that the individual is oppressed and move forward towards individual liberation. And the quest for freedom or liberation is not some abstract thing, but represents a state of imminence, or if you like, a pedagogical project. Freedom is not a commodity that can be handed over or implanted in people. It must be taught in a way that enables the unfree to comprehend their current situation. For what it is, and if they realise they are dissatisfied with it, then they must strive to change it. According to Freire, ultimately freedom is a process of self-liberation from the current reality in a quest towards conscientization. I can never pronounce that word, but it's conscientization, yeah? The process of sensing and cognition, uh, though important for human existence, yeah? The process of sense and cognition, which is often what most psychologists are interested in when they talk about education and development, yeah? Though important for human existence, is not enough. For liberation to happen, we need to read, read it, understand it, and ultimately make a conscious effort to change, yeah? Of course, drawing a roadmap for liberation is one thing. Actually making a journey is altogether a more daunting prospect. And the main obstacle that prevents people from becoming liberated is, of course, the oppressive reality that absorbs those within it and thereby, thereby acts to submerge human beings' consciousness, yeah? But the key thing to self-liberation, suggesting a pedagogy where the oppressed must take an active role in their education, where there is a yearn for something more, since freedom from oppression cannot be given to them, it must be the own self-constructed goal. The oppressors cannot develop pedagogy such as this because it is them who are dehumanising the oppressed, whilst at the same time dehumanising themselves, they become trapped in the very same pedagogy of the oppressed that they deploy to, deploy to maintain their dominance. The only difference is that they, they p p occupy a dominant position and therefore probably life is a bit better than if you're on the, on the ground. 
A key theme in critical pedagogy is, need, is the need for an expanded and more egalitarian conception of the intellectual, intellectuality itself. Yeah? The ideas of Ma uh, Gramsci are important here since he is one of the first people to theorise the role of intellectuals in the production and reproduction of power relations. Against the conventional understanding of intellectuals, whom Gramsci termed traditional intellectuals, he counterposed what he called organic intellectuals, who emerged from within and amongst the popular classes of society. The recognition of organic intellectuals linked together Gramsci's an emancipatory vision of intellectuals and the idea of proletarian emancipation itself. Uh, and this is what Gramsci said, for a mass of people to be led to think coherently and in the same current fashion about the real present the real present world is a philosophical event, event far more important and original than the discovery by some philosophical genius of a truth, which remains the property of some groups of intellectuals. And remember, Gramsci famously said that all human beings are philosophers, all men are intellectuals. And I think what he was saying there is that, in a sense, to be human is to think about your life, think about your world, yeah? And I guess to deny your humanity, to deny your capa inherent capacity to be able to be thinkers of your lives. Yeah? Whilst Freire stands in, broad, uh, in a broadly Marxist uh, tradition of social transformation, he develops this question differently to Gramsci through a focus on theorising the mode of participation within educational processes themselves. This expresses the way critical pedagogy seeks to foreground the impact of social relations of power which could be at this level of class, race and or gender, act to silence those who are less powerful. What we might call falling Paolo for, uh, um, Pierre Bourdieu's work, Symbolic Violence. And you know, Bourdieu's work on symbolic violence very much links with Freire's work on internalisation of oppression. The point here is that the capacity for individuals to critically evaluate different truth claims takes place on a radically uneven train, terrain. Just as Marx argued that the religiosity of oppressed workers represented much more than their lack of enlightenment, so Freire argues that the passivity of the so-called uneducated cannot be seen as reflecting their lack of capacity for critical thought. Rather, he saw this as an inevitable consequence of their construction within a political economy of entitlement. A question of who was allowed to speak and who was not. In a key passage from his seminal text, The Pedagogy of the Press, he notes the inherent resistance which oppressed groups have in articulating themselves. He says the press suffer from a duality which has established itself in their innermost being. They discover that without freedom they cannot exist authentically, yet although they desire authentic existence, they fear it. They are one and at the same time, uh, time themselves and the oppressor, whose consciousness they have internalised. The conflict lies in the choice between following prescriptions or having choices, between spectators or actors, between speaking or remaining silent. And for Freire, pedagogy was the basis by which traditional educational process silenced, uh, he called domesticated people, uh, for whom learning remained entirely separate to their consciousness and subjectivity, uh, to their real lives, as opposed to critical pedagogy, which sought to give students license to speak in their own voices, in that process, developing insights into both themselves and the world in which they live. The distinction he develops here is between, between what he calls the banking concept of education versus problem-posing education. Within banking education, students are conceived as simply receptacles to be filled by the teacher, whereas in the problem-posing education, uh, the, the learner takes control of their own destiny. They take control of the, of the curriculum, if you like. Uh, if Sen offers a socio-economic understanding of the relationship between inequity, he, freedom and human development, then Freire provides us with a very precise, I'm coming to the end now, precise strategy of engagement with the oppressed. And here the concept of dialogue as something much more than, in, uh, than the inherent value of people talking with each other becomes pivotal. So dialogue is really uh, important. For Freire, whether one is a teacher, social worker, community activist, trade unionist or whatever, Dialogue requires a higher degree of mutual engagement. He seeks a radical reorientation of traditional didactic forms of engaging and teaching where the relationship is vertical, which, as I say, he terms as the banking principle, to one that is horizontal, where power and control in the pedagogical process is mutually shared. It would be a mistake to think that critical pedagogy simply 
encompasses a kind of participatory teaching method for freely critical pedagogy about the nurturance of intellectual capabilities, but not as a tool to de develop literacy and understanding only, but for overcoming the idea that one is not entitled to speak, where one feels no sense of value in one's experience. As Irwin notes, the point is to, quote, avoid fatalism and determinism, aspects of behaviour which Freire sees as plaguing the oppressed and their conditions, as well as their possibilities for overcoming oppression. In a nutshell, speaking in this sense is related to the discovery of the capacity for human agency, or as Sen would argue, developing the capacity to make real choices. That's what Sen talks about, the capacity to make real choices. Implicit within uh, this is the way the Freudian tradition of critical pedagogy seems to integrate the emotional dimension, the affective, if you like, to the impact of oppression within learning processes. And in his text, teachers as cultural workers, letters to those who dare to teach, Freire provides several qualities of virtues he believes are indispensable for teachers, namely humility, courage, tolerance and lovingness. Uh, humility, Freire explains, involves listening to all that come to us, regardless of their intellectual level. Because it is a human duty that helps us identify with democracy and not with elitism. And courage is also a necess necessary quality because it helps us conquer the fears that limit and control us. And tolerance allows education to be progressive because it teaches us to live and work with those who are different from us. And lovingness, Freire says, gives us gives our work meaning. And in her book, Reinventing Freire, Pedagogy of Love, Antonia Dada argues, teachers could find the strength, faith and humility to establish solidarity and struggle together to transform the oppressive ideologies and practices of public education. If they commit to transforming their classroom practice into an act of profound love. This interesting notion of, so it's almost like the work we're doing is about profound love. So just to conclude then, in this discussion I've sought to offer both a contextual and theoretical understanding of the work of Amartya Sen and Paolo Freire. And I've suggested that whilst being very different in the way they come to the problem of human development in the quest for expanding human capabilities, there's a real symbiosis between the two. If Sen offers a policy framework for development, then Freire provides a mechanism for engaging with ordinary citizens for them to be able to express real freedoms in this regard, professions such as social work can benefit immensely from this approach, not least given their professional body statements make important references to such ideas as anti-oppressive and anti-discriminatory practice, user empowerment and choice. The capability approach does not mitigate against structural and resource-based approaches to rights. However, it does uh, allow us to evaluate to what extent top-down remedies can make a difference to the lived lives of citizens and in the context of the ongoing inequalities and oppression that surrounds us, both in the developed and developing world, give us uh, some radical kind of intervention methods. Uh, given that the macroeconomics of neoliberalism has had a dramatic impact on our, our behaviours, mostly I would suggest negative, it's plausible to think that the reverse too could be the truth. And neoliberals across the globe are all too ready to quote figures about how many millions of people have been lifted out of poverty through the magic of neoliberal capitalism. However, in taking uh, India as a case study in his book, An Uncertain Glory, India and Its Contradictions, Paolo Ferreri, uh, sorry, Amartya Sen, with his collaborator, John Dreze, is scathing about the so-called booming Indian economy and the pitiful investment in health and education. His argument is that key to uplifting the poor, dispossessed and the oppressed is social investment specifically in universal systems of education and health, which sadly under neoliberalism have either not materialised or become decimated. And so in a period of human history where inequalities are increasing in most nations across the globe, and remember that within most nations inequality is actually on the increase, although between nations there seems to be some kind of closure, within the nations they're increasing, and where climate change is likely to dramatically increase levels of social and climate injustice, there's an urgent need for the oppressed to mobilise and claim power. And when uh, it seems easier to envisage the end of the world rather than enter a system that could uh, ta uh, take us there, what John Holloway said, then perhaps we could all benefit from cr Freire and critical pedagogy. In an age of globalisation and the internet, the terrain upon which both policy and pedagogy 
are unfolding is rapidly changing. In today's connected world, the possibility of generating new ways of engaging critical dialogue and new knowledge is, is immense, as well as opening up new forms of democratic association and problem solving. The internet provides tools that dramatically extended our ability to reach out into the world. Therefore, perhaps the future projects seek to extend human capabilities and genuine transformative learning will lie in new, pedag lie in new pedagogical opportunities emerging from combining the possibilities thrown up by new information technologies, social media, along with real face-to-face -face engagement. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>